you could make millions of dollars being a red teamer. Like we see it all the time. Imagine if no matter what your background is, you have an equal shot of getting the job that you want. I don't know if it's a good company or a bad company to work at. They always know the numbers. Don't fall for that trick because they're going to underpay you. No, the CFA law. What's that going to do with Ronald Reagan? And you Oh, know? God. We have laws around the world that don't protect people in the security community. Hey everyone, David Bumble back with a very, very special guest. Chloe, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me on here. I'm excited. You've been in the game a long time, mm -hmm. helping new people and people, giving them some direction. Because often when you start out, you're not quite sure. I'm, I wish I was 21, but let's say I was for, the, for, this, for this discussion. What kind of advice would you give me, say in 2023? Or, you know, what, what would I, if I want to get into this industry, where would I start? What would you advise me to do? I always tell people to go to Tribe of Hackers. There's a book to learn a little bit about the different players in it. So your red team, blue team, purple team, you're going to want to know which one you would probably do best in. I always recommend that first. That's a good starting place is go Tribe of Hackers. From Tribe of Hackers, once you have an idea from there, what kind of role you want to start going towards, then you're going to need to get trained. Start learning. You need to learn if this is a good role for you or not. So watch YouTube videos about what's it like to be a SOC analyst, for example, or what's it like to be a penetration tester? And then from there, you'll be able to know where to go next. I would say that when it comes to the job recs, don't pay attention to number of years of experience. They should not be on their period. In my opinion, for many people, we have the same belief here. Don't pay attention to that. When you see college degrees, don't pay attention to that either. But do keep an eye on what certs it mentions. If you see that a certain role keeps mentioning the same cert, then that's something that you may want to study for. But I highly recommend do not study or invest any of your time, nor money or energy into any certs unless you know that's the job you want because that takes a lot of your time. What you can do is that when you start submitting your application around on your resume, you can say you can put that cert there and say in progress. You don't have to wait until you pass it to be able to apply for jobs. And that's like the biggest thing I always tell people is to, you know, you don't have to have everything before you apply. You just need to show that you're curious and you want to learn and you're rolling up your sleeves, but also to get in ingrained in the hacker community. There's InfoSec Twitter, follow some people on there, kind of learn from them, attend a couple conferences. I always say B-sides are great conferences. They're affordable. So go to one of those to get an idea of what it's like to be on the community, network there a little bit too. And then from there, you'll have a really good starting point. Also volunteer. So volunteering at conferences, that's how you actually end up making some really great connections. I volunteered at B-Sides Las Vegas and those people helped me so much yeah. in my career in the first two years. And still to this day, we connect with each other. So volunteering is something that we're very much engaged with in the community. Volunteer your time, share your resources. That is how you get plugged in the community and the community will support you. And don't be shy to DM people or ask questions. Just don't go up to someone like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor. Can you be my mentor? Okay, that's like the biggest thing I would say. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Instead, start building a relationship with that person, ask questions, and then see if this would be a good person to mentor you because it takes a lot of homework for you and for the mentor as well. So before you are like, I don't know what I want to do in my career in InfoSec, I need a mentor. Can you be my mentor? Don't do that. Read Tribe of Hackers, figure out what team you want to be on, what roles seem to work good for you. YouTube, use it. There's lots of videos out there of people talking about their roles and learn from that and then start doing the training part. Tribe of Hackers is a book, right? Yes, it is a book. It is a series, but the first book is the most important book, I think, of all. And that that explains like blue, red, purple, and then try, tries to tell you, well, you tell me, is that what it does? Yeah. And so basically, Tribe of Hackers is kind of like that chicken soup for the soul situation um, yeah. where you have different people put in, you know, they're filling out this common questionnaire that everyone does to give their best advice and share their experiences. But also you learn about the role that they have in everything behind the scenes of having that role. So it may give you an idea if anyone matches you and your background, but also those are things that you find like you would want to do. 
That's brilliant. I mean, like when it comes to search, because <laughs> I want to open up a can of worms, but I mean, it's um, you've got a lot of experience, as as I said, and you know, you've been in the game a long time, and you, you've spoken to a lot of people. It's I, I love getting like perspectives from people who've who've been down this road on YouTube. A lot of people like the red team, and then they always yes. the so that always seems to come up as OECP. But I mean, you, you made a really good point. I mean, blue versus red, the certs would be vastly different, right? Yes, very much. It really depends what kind of role you want. And there are people that shift from being a red teamer to a blue teamer because the thing is, is that when you become a blue teamer, you have a lot more of a relaxed feel about having your job and keeping it. Being a red teamer is you're going to have to be comfortable being on your A game all the time. And that's the same for blue teamers. It's just, there are so many possibilities when you're a blue teamer working for companies. A lot of red teamers I know that are incredibly successful, they end up doing their own consulting. So it really depends on what kind of thing you're more interested in. If you're more of like, I want to be a team player, I would say blue teamer. If you're more of like, I want to be independent and I like to break things, not necessarily fix things or protect things, then yeah, you might think of being a red teamer. I always say is like, if you play a game of chess, what kind of player are you? Are you a defensive one where you're like saving your pawns and everyone the whole time, but you're thinking you were going to win, but you're still saving everyone? Or are you that person who's like, I'm going to get rid of my knight here and my tower. I'm going to have a better advantage at the end. So if you're thinking more of like an aggressive way, I think like red team might be a good focus for you. And then if you're more of like, I want to protect all my pieces, blue team as well, but purple teams exist. So purple team is the ability to be that middle player where you can do both. So I think one of the things that we tend to forget about is that even if you're a red team or a blue team, or you have to understand each other's side and what you do. That's how you play to your advantage. So if you're a blue teamer, it's best for you to know what red teamers do so you can defend yourself from attackers. If you're a red teamer, it's smart for you to learn how the blue team works because then you'll know how to get through their defenses. So then you have your purple teamers. And these are the people that are like, well, I kind of do it evenly all the time. When I play chess, I kind of switch on and off. It depends on who I'm playing against. You have to think about it that way. If you're more of that person who can do both sides, purple team might be a good fit for you. I think, I mean, one of the concerns is, okay, maybe I love red teaming, but there's so few jobs and I need to, I mean, is that right? There's, there's more yeah. jobs in blue and um, you have to be at a really certain level of skill before you can be like a red teamer, right? Yeah. So I would say if you're a red teamer, one of the things you're going to want to focus on is also doing bug bounty work. It keeps you in practice and in shape. Um, because you'll have to know the latest tools and techniques. So I always think of doing bug bounty. If you're a red teamer, if you're a blue teamer, it might be good for you to practice too. Um, but yeah, when you're a red teamer, a lot of times you have to be highly skilled to be able to become like that multimillionaire. But yes, you could make millions of dollars being a red teamer. Like we see it all the time. But yeah, blue teamer, which is more stable for most companies because they're always looking for blue teamers, always. Red teamers, not as much because they'll just hire a consultant who's that red teamer. So it depends what company you're looking at or where you want to work at. Bigger companies will have a red team. Uh, smaller companies will probably go outside to look for a consultant to be a red teamer for them. Would you, let the, I said the kind of worms, degrees or certs or both? Oh, God. I have a master's <laughs> degree and I'll be honest, like none of that was applicable to what I'm doing today. I guess on the research side, cause I was, so I did my master's in the UK and they have that taught or research path and I did the research. So I learned how to do research. Um, I use that to this day at least, but yeah, you don't need a college degree. You really don't. I mean, if you're thinking about like a leadership position and you want to be a CEO one day or a COO, you may want to look at getting an MBA. It may not hurt you, but there are people that don't have that and they're totally fine. I mean, college degrees, it's up to you if you want to get one. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's more about your skill. How skilled are you? Don't let your degrees be the thing that showcases this is my skill because I guarantee you, you'll be tested and it may not match what you have. And so that's the thing you have to be most concerned about. I love that. I mean, perhaps you can share some of the, you know, the tips that you found, like, what are people learning if they want to go like down different paths? And, you know, what are the mistakes they're making? Because I think sometimes it's nice to say, okay, this is what you need to do. But then people often make mistakes and you can like help people avoid those. Yeah. So I think a lot of times people, when they first want to get into security, they always want to go red team. Yep. Because it's sexy, let's be honest. And so they'll go on to like a career path on pen testing or penetration tester. And they'll go through the content and everything. But then they realize, oh, wait, but if I want to get a job, maybe I should go a SOC 1 analyst. So then they look into being a SOC 1 analyst, but then realize, oh, maybe I 
actually you should be a SOC 2 analyst. So the thing is, is like when you have these career paths where you're able to know which one would be better fit for you based on your background, but also what grabs your attention because there's a syllabus there and there's things of like, I am interested in these areas. I am interested in those areas. And you can always do both. So I think a lot of times people get, when they first get on, they're like, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. And yep. most of the time people are like, I need to get a degree. I need to get a cert. Because that's how our our world has been like, right? Degrees come yep. forward, right? And so they'll go and do these certs and study when in reality, maybe that's not the role that they wanted in the first place. So I always tell people, go start with a career path. See which one is better fit for you. Then look at the career postings, the job postings for you. And then see if there's any certs that are mentioned multiple times. And then go to the platform in a sense to then start prepping for those particular certs. So I always think it's always good to first focus on what makes you happy. Yeah. What are you passionate about to continue? But also know if you want to transition from one role to another, you have that ability completely, but then start there and then go to the certs. Because I always see people first going to the certs. Then when they're getting all these different certs and they're like, I don't know what role to get next. And then I'm like, you have to do the reverse. And so don't waste your time on certs and which ones to get. Focus your time on what job you want and the skills you need to have for that role. And then do the cert. But you don't have to get it before applying. Remember, everyone, you don't have to do that. I love that advice because, I mean, the mistake I see so often, and I mean, it's YouTube is partly to blame or whatever. It's cool and sexy to be red teamer. It's like, I must be, I must do OSCP if I want to get into cyber. Yeah. Nope. You don't need to do that. I have no certs in cybersecurity and I'm fine. So <laughs> some of the best hackers that we know of have no certs and they're okay too. But it, it does depend on what your career that you want. And so it really depends on what job you want. And then you can be able to move it forward. Do you remember that hacker handbook? Like the second edition, it's like yep. this thick. Got a few of them uh, here. Yeah. Yep. No, now I use that as my paperweight for holding <laughs> down rugs to get them in a the perfect place. But I used to read and like read and like highlight and, and post it and all that stuff. And now you have like other, like you now you have burp sweet courses. And I'm like, oh my God, my life would have been so much easier if I knew about this. No, I agree. I mean, it's it's different people learn differently, isn't it? And you've got to find what, what, what works for you. Some people like books, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's um, I love the combination of going onto YouTube or like there's so much free training or low cost training out there. It's nice to hear about other options. Because I've seen so many people fall into these traps of going to do boot camps, which cost like $10,000. And if you think about it, you have to take out loans for that. And it doesn't even promise you an actual job. And then you have people that are now also, you know, being contacted by universities like, hey, get your master's in cybersecurity, but it's all theory based. It's nothing yep. practical. And so I'm seeing all these like marketing gimmicks to get people to spend and get loans. And when in reality it's like, no, that's not what's crazy. what we need. We need something that's accessible and affordable where it's flexible. I can learn anywhere I go. Also that I know that I can afford it. I think one of the things that makes me stay in InfoSec is the fact that having a purpose to change situations. We have so many barriers, gatekeeping happening, but especially if you're someone who's marginalized. And by marginalized, it's not just, a, you know, it's race, it's gender, it's college background, your yeah. financial income when you were growing up, being in certain locations. Imagine yep. if no matter what your background is, you have an equal shot of getting the job that you want. Because I'm so tired of them complaining we don't have enough people on our team. We don't, we have a skill shortage thing. It's like these are all easy fixes. It all is very easy at the end of the day. And what it is is to make something accessible and affordable and get rid of all these degree needs. Instead, state what you are looking for and then hire someone who is energized and willing to learn and bring them on board and don't assume. On day one, they have to know everything because no job in any industry has that. So we shouldn't be thinking that we're the same way. I'm glad to hear that you're passionate about it because it's it's crazy. There's such a need for, for new people in the industry, and yet there's all these barriers. What does it help? I mean, the only way you're going to solve this is to by getting more and more people from around the world involved. Exactly. I think I've heard you say this, uh, talk about this before, and I, want, I just thought about it now. How do you recognize a good company? So let's say I, I want to look for a job. I mean, companies are interviewing me, but you should also interview the company that you're going to work at. You yes. don't just want to work at some random company. What advice would you give someone, you know, for an interview? Or yeah, if I'm looking to go work at, let's say, this two companies, how do I know if it's a good company or a bad company to work at? So I was kind of first 
first think of it as like what you suggested, which is the interview goes both ways. So the more confident you are, and by confident, I mean confident, but not cocky. I just want to put it out there. I describe myself, three words, hardworking, alpha male, jackhammer, merciless. Be confident in yourself and be calm with yourself. Be yourself too at the same time. And, you know, as long as you are being yourself in those conversations and being transparent and they're being transparent with you, that's really good. I always like to ask the question, which is what are the things that you wish to change on your team? Or what are the things that you wish you could change on in your department? And getting that question asked to each individual people, you'll learn so much about what's going on behind scenes. Because the interview for you is to know what is going on behind the glossy side because that's what they're doing with you. So you do it in return. You want to know what is the work-life culture. You also want to know, can I balance my my head and thoughts while working here? And what I mean by that is not necessarily a work-life balance, but more of like, will I feel valued here? Or will I be micromanaged here? Whoever you're, who's going to be your leader, also ask them, what is your leadership style like? And then also ask, how do you give feedback? feedback. How, what do you usually do on that? And then the other part is when you talk to the people on your team during the interview process, which you should always push for, always ask to interview the people that you'd be working with. A lot of people don't know that, but you have every right to ask that. That's how you're going to find out, is this a team that is going to be playing political games or is this going to be a team that's going to empower one another? That's what you want to find out. Always ask what your needs are. If it's a small company, you have have every right also to ask, can I meet with your CEO? Or can I meet with the COO? Or can I meet with one of your founders? Or can I meet with the CISO? Take me to your leader. <laughs> it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, no matter what career you have, even if InfoSec isn't what you're thinking of, but you're just watching this YouTube video, the best advice I can give you is always ask to meet with other people outside the department, outside the team, but also ask to interview the people within the team. And it doesn't matter what role they have. If it's someone you're going to be working with quite a bit, you need to learn a little bit more about what that situation is like. Don't be scared to ask what you need. I love that because it's an interview is such a short period of time and it's often one way. And I'm glad you, you're saying turn the tables. And then salary, I have no idea how to give you advice on that. I mean, the good news is that certain states, in, like in the US, they now give you a scale of how the salary should be on either every single job post, that's wonderful versus playing the guessing game. But know your worth, know what the average is, ask a little bit over the average, and you'll be okay at the end of the day. And learn about shares. When you say learn about shares, like get a share in the company, right? Yeah, equity. You want to learn about equity, 401k. It doesn't matter if you're in your early 20s, start doing your 401k now. Like Retirement matters. Start investing in that. Look into mutual funds. There's so many things I wish I knew like earlier in life, but financial bits, learn about it. How will this pave the road for you in the long term? And make sure that you, wherever you are going for your company, vision yourself staying there for at least one year. No matter how bad it gets, at least stay for one year. Unless it, if it's de- detrimental for your mental health, then yet yeah, start looking. But honestly, just always see yourself as I could work here for one year at least and start there. There's a friend of mine, he um he didn't negotiate so hard on salary. He negotiated really hard on shares. And now he's done really well for himself because he worked for a lot of the big tech companies and he got a lot of shares as part of the package. And I think he's done great because of that. Honestly, it's the best way, especially if it's a startup. They can't give you a high salary, but you can always negotiate shares. So advice is make sure you interview the as high up the ladder as you can go interview the team to so interview try and get a, get a feel outside of the group that you're working with try and get shares so they might not see that as such a big cost versus salary so then you might be able to get a bigger package right salary it's hard isn't it uh, any advice around salary you've mentioned it but any other advice that you you could give i would say you know the good news is that we have the internet and there yep. are Glassdoor, there's, I think there's this one called Pay is another one. And so basically you want to look at the title that you have, the location that you're in to really know what will be that salary range. But also you can, when the recruiter contacts you, and I wish someone told me about this a, like in my early 20s, which is when a recruiter is like, what is your desired salary? Yeah. Don't <laughs> answer it. Don't answer it because you just set yourself up to fail. Don't yep. answer it. Instead of say, at this time, it's too early in the process for me to give you an actual number. However, do you happen to have the scale handy 
about what this role may provide. Say that instead. Throw it on them because they know the numbers. They always know the numbers. Don't fall for that trick because they're going to underpay you. Always wait first for them to tell you what that pay scale is. And if they're like, well, you know, we don't really know at this time. Like, great. So next time when I talk to someone, I would like to know that number. Just go straight for it. Be a shark. <laughs> Not Don't come off too aggressive. You can be kind and aggressive at the same time, but don't come off as a shark. Like you're going to tell me right now or else I'm not going to attend any more of these interviews. Don't do that. Be like, okay, can I at least know within by the next interview, can you email me that number or give me a call when you have that number? It's it's such good advice. I've seen I've seen on Twitter a few people who have posted. Oh, I this is what I was expecting, like eighty thousand. But they, they when they came back, they said the range was one hundred and fifty to two hundred or something. Yeah. And I got double of what I was expecting, just because they didn't give a number. Yeah. And then if you have another offer on the table, or if you are interviewing with someone else, let them know, and they'll be like, okay, should we push this forward faster? Be like, yes, hands down, say yes. You want to move things along. So if you are, someone else is contacting you for a different role and you're just about to possibly start the interview process with them, when you're talking to that company, be like, yes, I'm interviewing with another company. So you know, if any way that we could speed up the process or any way that I can make this basically speed it up in any sort of way, that'd be great. Because that's, that's how people are getting those jobs and you're not. It's because they're playing that game where it's just like, I already have an offer on the table because then they're like, okay, we're not going to book interviews for these other candidates. We got to get this person in and see if we want to do this. And I guarantee you, because they know that that person already has an offer, then they're going to assume that person is the best fit because they already are, people want them. I love this. Any any any, any more advice? Because I love this. This is fantastic. To anyone who looks at a job post and is like, I don't meet 100% of that criteria. I hate to tell you this, but most people will still apply. So even if you don't meet it, apply for it. And your cover letter, hopefully they don't need a cover letter. But if they do, make sure that it's not a blanket statement where you're sending it to everyone else. You know, you can create kind of like a a template where you have what you want. Make sure that they know, but also put in there why you want to work for them. Because some companies, they look at that cover letter before your resume. So it really, no one really knows. Cover letters is kind of like, I don't know. I, I have a hate love relationship with them. I love it. It's fantastic advice. I think the um, you've got to use everything to your advantage. If you're able to double your salary or get an increase, it can change your life. Absolutely. And whenever someone's like, oh, we do promotions every year. So salary arrangements can happen every year only. Don't believe that. Guarantee you don't believe in that. You can always negotiate your salary. Always. If you're taking on a lot more work, negotiate. No, I just like basically that's all you want to know. You can salary is always negotiable. Yeah, I, I I find it it's amazing. Like in recent times, it just feels like more and more work gets dumped on the same person. Like someone leaves and your workload goes up. That's you. You want to ask for more money at that time. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't be working for free, or at least negotiate a higher title. So even if you can't get the pay that you want, negotiate a higher title. And the reason for that is because at least you have that on your resume. And also, after you know being there for six months or one year, then you can actually negotiate the salary that would match that title. So always use your title also as a way to negotiate negotiate a higher amount. I'm loving this, Chloe. Any any tips on the interview? Like, uh, do I have to dress a certain way? I mean, that's cultural in many ways. Any tips that you can give, you know, someone in the interview? Uh, yeah, no matter what your gender is, wear a button up shirt. And that's it. You can wear yoga pants underneath. I, don't, I mean, if you're doing a virtual thing, you'd be wearing PJs, who cares? But the thing is, wear a button up shirt because it's better to just dress like that versus wear a coat with it or a jacket with it or a tie with it. Because everyone appreciates someone with a button up shirt. But if you're not wearing a button up shirt, you know, people might think that you're too lax or it's not enough. So just wear a button up shirt and you'll be safe. And blue. So there's certain colors you should think about blue and green and purple. Those actually bring out trust. So if you're trying to trust people and get them to trust you, use colors to your advantage. I was going to say you could wear black. I have worn a button up black shirt and that was fine. Just as long as your background is quite light. If you have a dark, I used to live, I used to call it the cave because I had soundproofing <laughs> things all over my that, wall. Yeah. So it was all dark, right? So I would wear this black button up shirt and people like, I see a floating head. So be aware of your surroundings. <laughs> When you do these interviews, um, take down notes in your interview. People like to see that you're actually focused. Yeah, and just be yourself. But honestly, by saying be yourself, don't actually be your authentic self. Like as if you're hanging out with your best friends, be more about yourself, how you would be with colleagues. Red flags. 
any anything that you can think that I, you know, if I go oh, in, what's red flag? If ever someone's like, you have a great smile. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. I had to face this quite a bit last, like last year I was interviewing and I don't know what happened, but every time I was interviewing, they're like, you have a great smile. Have you thought about doing this role instead? Have you thought about being an evangelist instead? I'm like, that's not the job I'm applying for. So anytime someone's like, have you ever thought about this role instead? And it's not the job you applied for, that can be a red flag. Just be aware of that. If anyone is like, you know what, I think you're too junior for this role or you're too senior for this role, have them explain a little bit why they think that way. Oh, and if ever someone's like, I don't know if you're a good culture fit or we find you not a good culture fit. That was flat out discrimination. No one ever says you're not a good culture fit unless they're discriminating. Just think about that. It's a, it's a form of discrimination. So just note about that and get re- excited for rejections, but then get excited for acceptances. And it does take time. It could take up to a year, but also make sure that your LinkedIn is up to date. Use it to your, the best advantage. Also continue to upskill, keep educating yourself, read books or get an app where it reads the book for you. YouTube. I don't know. Maybe check out David's videos. I mean, like learn, use this time to learn. That's the fun part of not being employed. You get this time to recharge and learn new things and also do stuff outside of InfoSec. A lot of us, we live and breathe InfoSec. Do something artistic, learn to play a guitar, paint, do something, but do something outside of technology in general and you'll be okay. I love that. I, lo- I love that. Fantastic advice. So let's uh, let, let's change track. I want to hit on something because you started an organization saying hacking is not a crime. Yes. And you talk about the difference between a hacker and an attacker. Is that right? Yes. Could you explain what that means? Like, give us yeah. your vision here. What's the difference? And I want to te- go down this road. Like, you, you say companies are failing because they don't take care of hackers or don't engage with the hacking community. So I want to give you the floor. You know, tell us a bit about the, you know, the history of why this started and why you think it's important that we differentiate and, you know, we, we can have a whole discussion about this. Absolutely. I was about to just roll my sleeves right now, David. And so <laughs> I keep like it going on I this. Like it. So for those that aren't aware, is that in the hacker community, yes, we have a hacker community. It's basically, uh, Twitter, InfoSec Twitter, we <laughs> usually say. Um, but basically, it's the idea of a hacker, someone who is creative and trying to find ways how to fix something or break something. But basically, you're looking for, you know, you want to know how does this work? How can I manipulate this thing? Or how could I make this better? So I think a lot of us have a hacker mindset just in general. Even lawyers do. They're always looking for loopholes in the law, right? Yep, I like that. So everyone is basically a hacker. The difference between a hacker and a malicious actor is that a malicious actor will use their hacking skills to do something malicious. So that could be like blackmailing. That could be, you know, forcing people to pay something to get your data back. So these are people that are trying to get into your social media accounts to go into your private conversations. A lot of times when we talk about hackers in the community, the reality is is there's no white hat or black hat. At the end of the day, it's a scale of gray. I was going to use that joke of 50 shades of gray, but I'm not going (laughs) to go there. Um, But I mean, that's that's the reality about the hacker community is that you have a diverse folks that came in, you know, maybe they were malicious at one time, but then found out, oh, I could do this and make money and be safe. And then they transitioned or they didn't know. And then you have people that just fell by it by accident, which is very common too as well. But overall, hackers are good people. We like to use the term hacker in the community. Um, but we also go by security researcher as well. There are malicious actors and those are, you know, they are not the greatest people, but they are the attackers. But like I said, it also depends on the intent, right? So yeah. if the intent is to help others, and I see them as a hacker in that moment, if the intent was to hurt something or someone, then I see that as a malicious actor. So the big differentiation between the two is intent, right? Absolutely. I get this on YouTube a lot. Why are you teaching people to hack? But it's, I think you, you're a big advocate of this as well if companies don't have, i think you call it a vulnerability disclosure program mm-hmm. if if companies don't engage with the hacking community and i you've used i don't want to spoil it i mean it's better if you talk about it you've used the example of some big companies you know someone who was had good intent notified of a problem and then there was and they didn't do anything about it yeah. and they got you know there was a, there was something bigger happened so could you, you i don't want to i don't want to spoil it you oh, take it away remember equifax 
Yep. We had that big breach. But a lot of people aren't aware it's about six months before that breach was announced. It was actually a secure researcher or a hacker. Like I said, I'll use them interchangeably. Same person reported it and it was ignored. And so then we had the situation where we could have resolved that situation with Equifax if we just listened. So vulnerability disclosure policies or programs, VDPs, we also call them, they are they act like bridges. They're bridges yep. between an entity and the researcher to be able Able to report what they're finding, their vulnerabilities, and for that company to then take it forward to fix those problems. We also had that a case with DJI, you know, that well-known yeah. drone manufacturer. So this is our one of my favorite ones to tell. So basically, there was two researchers that came across DJI. They just released a vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty program. And what ended up happening was that the researchers they reached out to get clarity and to confirm what what's in scope, what's out of scope. So when we use these terms out of scope, in scope, these are things where you're allowed to hack on, things you're not allowed to hack on. So basically they confirmed, but it took about two weeks for your J. DGI to get back to them about it. So that was a big flag right there. And so then they reported the vulnerability. They were gifted $30,000, but they would have to sign a contract. That contract didn't provide any protections for them. So basically, one of them walked away, was like, I'm not, no, I'm not, I don't need this money. I'm not risking my family and my life. And so what ended up happening was that their PR group found out and got nervous. And they're like, this could be a big PR situation for us. We need to act fast. The problem was that they didn't realize that when they were emailing him and following up with him is that they had the internal conversations within that email chain. Wow. So he saw it and he was like, what is going on? Why am I a threat? I just want to walk away. I want to keep myself safe here. I don't care about your money. I just don't want to get involved. And then they they served him. So they used the CFA, which is our Copy Fraud and Abuse Act. And it's all, all around the world. We have it. It's called anti-hacking law is pretty much saying that, you know, he went out of scope when in, indeed he stayed within scope and confirmed. And so in his reaction, he decided to post a public blog posting all the email chain. Remember that email chain yeah. that had the internal conversations? Those were all posted everywhere. Of course, they took back the lawsuit and and now he's fine and safe. But that's the reality is that we have laws around the world that don't protect people in the security community. Even if you are fully legal and you work for a company and you are a higher penetration tester, for example, you can still be sued and you have no legal protection. So every single person in security right now still has zero legal protection for what they do. So the thing is- it's crazy. Is to- Put an eye on that. Put a light on it for people to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, there's so many things that were wrong there. I think you've mentioned in the past one of the problems, and you mentioned it kind of now, the red flag that two weeks to to come back. One of the problems there was DJ, DJI decided to do this themselves, didn't they? They didn't go through one of the big bug exactly. bounty platforms. Yeah. So, and that's a that's a big problem of its own because when you run your own bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure program, you need to have a point person. You need someone who yeah. will be that program manager. If you don't have a program manager, then and who is it going to go to? And we see that also on social media, for example, if someone from the hacker community is like, I don't know who to contact because they don't have yeah. vulnerability disclosure policies. So I'm just going to DM them on social media. Guess who runs social media for the companies? <laughs> it's marketing. It's yeah. marketing and PR. So that means that they're going to take it to their legal team and then you might get a lawsuit just because you want to report a vulnerability. That's the reason why one out of four people that do find vulnerabilities, even if it's a zero day, they may not report it because they're afraid of what will happen to them in return. It's it's worrying. I mean, you've just mentioned the stat there. One in four don't report uh, a problem that they find. And I mean, that's crazy because it's like, you know, it's no wonder companies are getting hacked every day. Yeah, pretty much. Or they're being it- ignored, as we saw with Equifax. And there's so many other companies that have dealt with that situation as well. So, I mean, you trying to advocate this change in the mindset of companies that, look, hackers are good people. They're not people who wear hoodies. I think one of you, in one of your talks, you said hackers wear capes, not not hoodies. Yes. Um, even though that's sort of the marketing <laughs> material that's always used everywhere. Because the companies don't realize that if they don't allow the good people to tell them of their problems, the bad guys are going to take advantage of that. And I think you said, what, 94% of Forbes Global don't have a vulnerability disclosure policy, right? Yes, that is true. And it's unfortunate 
because that means that all those data of every individual that has an account with them, they're not working with the hacker community. And I think things are starting to shift. I would say that the bug bounty companies like Bug Crowd, Hacker One, um, and Synac as well. But Bug Crowd and Hacker One really changed yeah. the situation for the hacker community. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are today, which is having those bridges in the first place. So uh, one of the initiatives that I worked on with Casey Ellis, who's the founder of Bug Crowd, is called Disclose.io, which was based off of Amit Elzari's research about Safe Harbor. So this allows now people can go to Disclose.io to get disclosure policies, to work with the hacker community and start forming those bridges and also work in that Disclose.io community to learn a little bit further about how they could do best practices when it comes to working with the hacker community. We've highlighted the fact that there's a problem. Companies are getting breached every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's in the news every day almost. There's all these bugs or problems. Um, the bad people, if you like, are taking advantage of companies. The good people aren't or don't have a way to disclose bugs that they find. But hacker one companies like that are making it easier. And it is getting better. But I want to talk about the laws because I know you, you you, you oh mentioned God. the laws. You love the law. <laughs> but I mean, before we get there, let's talk about another case that's really sad. And that's Aaron. Can you just talk about that? And you kind of like people who perhaps don't know who are new to it. Explain what happened. Give us a bit of detail of the story. And it's it's another, I don't want to scare people off from getting into yeah. this because like, how do we fix this? But let's talk about one of, you know, what happened there. Yeah. So Aaron Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz, just an overall overview of what happened with this case is that he wanted to bring out articles and research that is in J store to the public because it's tax funded research. So he wanted everyone to have the opportunity to read and learn without having to deal with a paywall or having some connection to an academic research institute to be able yeah. to read them. And so he basically was able to get all that information out there. And in return, because of what he did, that was out of scope work. But the reality is that what his intent was, was to share. And that's very much about like, you know, the InfoSec community is all about sharing and yeah. open source. And one of the things though that happened in return was that there was someone who worked in a political office that wanted to use him as a representation of this is how we will go after you if you do this. So it became a prosecuting situation where they used him as the prime example of how they can go about it. And in a very scary way, what ended up happening was that Aaron Swartz was facing you know, over a million dollar of fines, but also and like basically unknown amount of years of him being in prison for it. And so as you can possibly imagine, that type of pressure of not knowing when this case would close, how long would he spend in prison, what would be the monetary amount, but just overall, he wasn't trying to do something bad. Like I said, intent matters in this case. And so what ended up happening was that unfortunately, we lost Aaron Swartz by uh, death by suicide. And so when we think about our current laws and how they are used, the reason that he was facing so many years in prison and terms was because how the CFAA is written. So basically, if you did, if you illegally downloaded or use something, one document, then that means that's the time you're going to be spending for that one document. But if you download millions of documents, then that's stacked upon stack of how many years you would be in prison, how many fines you would receive, because you could be charged multiple times for the very same crime. And so there was a situation where legislators came together and they would put together Aaron's law. And how this would work is that it would basically make the current CFA um, or that Copyright and Abuse Act would be more on today's terms, but also put restrictions in there as well. So you couldn't charge someone for multiple crimes for the same crime. Um, unfortunately, big tech companies were lobbying and made sure to not let that go forward. Oh, that's the unfortunate bit. And the reason because of that is because the CFA is also used on employees. So say, for example, uh, you worked at a company and you had access to a certain application, but you use the application for something different that's outside your role, that CFA could be used to prosecute 
you, even though it was part of your job to use that application, but because you used it differently than what the company wanted you to use it for. And that's not always that they tell you how they want you to use it for. Wow. They will find ways to use CFA against you. This is why it's very heavy and hard to change a CFA at this time because we have companies like that. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm, I'm not based in the US, so I don't understand all the US law. I think you, the US is a leader in a, in a lot of areas. And yes. I think you've mentioned it before, and it's very true. If, if one company, sorry, if one country changes their law, a lot of other countries learn from that and perhaps adapt. So this is one of the laws that needs to change. Just tell us, yes. for the people who don't know, the CFA law, what's that <laughs> got to do with Ronald Reagan? And, oh, you know, God. <laughs> <laughs> so Ronald Reagan basically got to catch a premiere of War Games. And if anyone has seen it, it's basically a movie about a hacker who was able to get into a database which he didn't have the rights to get into. And so because of this, it scared Reagan into being like, oh my God, we have to do something about these hackers because they yeah. can get into these really serious situations and we need to prosecute them immediately. We need to create fear. So the CFA was created because he watched that movie. Literally, it was that movie that created Bad. that legislation. He didn't have like advisors from the hacker community or like the tech community to be like, hey, what can we do about this situation? Make sure everyone's in the room because representation matters. Representation was not mattering at that time because the CFA was created and unfortunately is used all the time to prosecute hackers. And it was because of Ronald Reagan doing the CFA that then created other fallen countries like you were sharing earlier to have anti-hacking laws as well. So they it, follow. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, that laws can be made by from movies. But I mean, some people would say that's what happened in the UK because of, you know, the, the, the COVID situation. The the minister at the time, yeah, was watching a movie and then he decided to make his policy based on that. And I'll just say that in jest. I don't know how true that is. But anyway, people would say something similar. DMCA, what is that and why do you love it? And I say that, in, <laughs> I say that sarcastically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is what we call it in the US, but in I think the UK and Canada, they just call it the copyright law or like, <laughs> like it's basically just copyright laws. It's the ability for you to not, well, I'll rewind. You bought an iPhone and you notice that you know, the, your camera isn't working. But unfortunately for you to go to an Apple store to get it fixed, it would take you two weeks to do that. However, if you could, you would like to fix it yourself. The copyright laws, how they work is that even though you purchase that item, you do not actually own that item to change it. So that's why jailbreaking phones is not always an okay thing to do. But one of my favorite ones is, uh, so in the US, we have we talked about this one in particular, John Deere, those tractors. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's so, crazy. Tell, tell yeah. us about that. I think it's insane. Yeah. Go so, on. So John Deere, um, basically, you have all these tractors and people live in rural areas because they use it for farming. But the thing is, if something is broken, you have to find a way how to bring your tractor miles, like I mean miles, to somewhere where they have a place where they can fix it. But they're not going to fix it on the spot. You're going to have to wait for a while. What happens about your crops? If you cannot exactly. do anything with your crops, then you're going to lose money. It also costs money to bring your John Deere tractor to somewhere to get it fixed. And then you're going to have to pay for it to be fixed. And so what ended up happening was that all these uh, agriculturalists were going online to find the software to download it directly. And they could get penalized for doing that, even though they own the tractor themselves and they should have the right to do whatever they want with it because it's they want John Deere wants to control and make sure that they're the only ones that can fix it. Then, yeah, you're now dealing with a copyright situation. I mean, it's, it's it's mad. They're prosecuting farmers for fixing a tractor that he purchased. And yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not in the US, so I don't know all the details, but it's uh, it, it sounds insane that a farmer in the middle of nowhere, his, his crops are, are going to fail if he can't get the tractor yeah. fixed. And then he has to hack it with, and I believe the Ukrainians were involved in that as well, like trying to f like circumvent yeah. the John Deere software, or whatever. And then these farmers are getting prosecuted. It's, it seems mad. I mean, I think the um, the right to repair movement is, is fortunately because of, you know, some YouTubers and other people having an influence and iFixit and other companies, it, it seems to be gaining momentum. So, I mean, we, 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 we're painting a really bleak picture 
picture, I think. But is it getting better, Chloe? It's getting better. It is getting better. So in the US, the CFAA right now, it is starting to change a little bit. I would say also the DOD, CISA, CISA, they are great organizations that are pushing it forward to make sure that companies do have vulnerability disclosure policies and great practices of bridging that gap with the hacker community. I mean, the US government sees the hacker community as incredibly important part to keep the country secured. So there's always like hack the Pentagon. There's all these other programs. So we are getting there. Oh, and the only times that we're seeing the CFA being used at this time is by companies. Yeah. So companies in particular will use it against people um, in local government, not necessarily federal government anymore. So that's the good news. That has been a change that we've seen over the years. So there are some good things there. And also the safe harbor movement is definitely moving forward on that. Yeah. I mean, you, you started hacking is not a crime. You've also had influence trying to bridge. And I think a lot of people who watch are perhaps technical, but technical skills are not enough, are they? Because you've got to influence, you've got to influence the lawmakers. And I've, I've, I always laugh when I see some of the, I mean, uh, I mean, people call me a boomer, but I mean, I see older people perhaps who ask the most interesting questions about cell phones and technology because they have no clue. So you've got to have someone bridge that. And I mean, you've been involved in that because I don't always think the hacking community is necessarily that good, you know, telling the outside world. It, it's, is that is that is a fair statement? Or? I would say that communication is an issue. Yeah. So I think communication is definitely one of those things. How do you communicate risks? For example, how do you communicate? I need to finally these funds for my security team or I need the following tools. How do you make that case? So I think communication is one of those things that everyone can always use and including our security community as well. Yeah, I mean, you've been involved in that. And I mean, you've been advocating. You said we need to talk to the press. We yes. need to talk to government. We need to change the perception. And I mean, it's really encouraging to hear that because I mean, I was feeling like people perhaps watching and especially if they're young will think this is crazy. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to go to jail. But it, <laughs> it, it's definitely changing, right? It is. It is definitely changing. So just note that I think the most important thing is to know what your rights are at this time and just know that there are these areas of gray and that, you know, as long as you stay within scope and you have everything writing in writing matters because that will protect you. Like that DJI case with that hacker that protected him because he kept everything in writing. One of the things I always recommend to people is look for vulnerability disclosure policies. If they have one, make sure you follow it to the T always. Is. Honestly, just follow it. You're going to keep yourself safe that way. If they don't have a contact us situation, you could reach out to disclose.io. They may be able to connect you with someone who works at that company on the security team. Um, another way that you can go about it is that if you do something on social media, do not publicly tweet a company. You are not going to set yourself up for a good place. It's best yeah. to DM them, say, hi, I came across a vulnerability in a platform. I would like to report it. What's the email address for me to contact? Start there. Don't go, I found the following vulnerability. This is what's going on and everything. Don't say anything because it's owned by marketing. So it's best to say, I need to be connected with the security team. I found a vulnerability and start there. And just keep a collection of everything that you write, take screenshots, everything, protect yourself in every single way, and you'll be fine. Just protect yourself to be on the safe side. It's not always easy to hear, but I think it's really important advice that you've given there. I think a lot of hackers have this mindset, I want to tinker, I want to poke it, I want to see what's going on. Uh, and that can lead you to places that could get you into trouble. I, I'm really glad that you shared that. Also, like, look at programs like HackerOne, right? Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps stop there if you're interested. Yeah, HackerOne, Buckcrowd, they have some really great public programs that you can start getting your feet in. And like the more you do on there and the higher vulnerabilities that you find, um, you then get invited to private programs. And that's where a lot of fun happens. And also your rewards may increase significantly as well. Chloe, any closing thoughts? And I, I really want to say thank you, you know, for sharing so much wisdom because I mean, there's tech skills, but there's also tech skills don't always get you the job that you really want. You have to you have to work on your soft skills and stuff like that as well. Um, and this and the, the tips you've given us are fantastic. But um, I want to give you the floor. Okay, couple things. One, if you're a company, invest in your team right now because if you don't invest in them, they're going to leave you and then you're going to have a really, really terrible time on security. So invest yep. in your people. It doesn't always have to be monetary. It's about listening to what they need and taking action. If that means no meetings Friday, that means no meetings Friday. Give people a break. Next thing, if you're an employee at this time, Learn your boundaries. Don't check Slack after work hours. Have a life outside of work. <laughs> Just do that. You need to. And get outside. Breathe some fresh air. Take a dog for a walk. 
learn a new skill, get off your computer. And I mean that we need a recharge. And then the other thing is that no matter what level you are in cybersecurity, there's always something for you to learn. When you're thinking that you have imposter syndrome, just note that it may just be because there's so much information out there, so many things you have to learn. There's always something new to learn, new tool, technique every day. And that's overwhelming. That can make anyone feel insecure and make you feel like you have imposter syndrome. And if you're someone who's marginalized, if you're a woman or a person of color, there is a really good article out there from Harvard Business Review that talks about imposter syndrome and how we always think that we have it, but in reality, we don't. It's because there's not enough representation. And because we don't see people in those positions, we feel like we are inadequate. And that's why we have imposter syndrome. So we don't have imposter syndrome. It's because of a lack of representation. I would say those are my my thoughts. And also, if you're a hacker out there, thank you for doing what you do. I love it, Chloe. Thanks so much. I, I definitely need to get you back because I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, to the audience, please put comments below. What kind of questions or put your questions below, comments below, things I can perhaps twist Chloe's arm to come and talk yes. about on a, another interview. I would That'd be love brilliant. to. Anytime, David. You just let me know and I'll jump on. Chloe, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. Have a good one.